our gospel reading for this morning comes from Mark, which seems to be the first of the four gospels written. And so, so what we have here is the first story of Jesus calling disciples. Listen to what the Spirit would speak to us through these words. Now after John was arrested, that's John the baptizer, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As they went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat, mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, and followed him. The word of the Lord. Thank you. How many of you have ever gone fishing? How many of you enjoy going fishing? You know, occasionally. You now, fishing's like a lot of other things. Some people like it, some people don't. But, but as a general rule, most of us don't think of fishing as something inherently evil. I'm not aware of any Christian denominations that forbid its members from going fishing. And, and I've never written a, a, a prayer of confession for the bulletin in worship that says, Lord, forgive us for catching fish. And I raise this because if I read the gospel correctly this morning, Simon and Andrew and James and John all repent of fishing. Now, true, they were fishing for a living, but I'm not sure that makes it any different. I'm not sure that makes them worse than recreational fishermen, bigger sinners or anything. And yet, in today's gospel, Jesus is portrayed going about saying to people, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And the very first action associated with this call to repent and believe is Jesus calling some fishermen to follow him. And immediately they repented and followed. I know, it doesn't actually say that they repented, but that's what happened. They turned away from what they had been doing, fishing, left their nets, their boat, their father, and went with Jesus. There may not have been anything wrong with fishing, anything bad or sinful about fishing, but they left it behind and walked away from it, even though it may have been the only way of life they had ever known. Now, the word repent doesn't get bandied about in conversation very often. For that matter, you don't hear it very often in Presbyterian churches unless it shows up in the Scripture reading for the day. That's because repent has taken on an almost entirely religious sense over the years, and that a negative one. Repent comes from the mouth of the scary-looking, bony-fingered uh, revival preacher who's pointing at someone who's going to hell if they don't. Repent over the years has come to mean stop being bad and start being good. Or perhaps more commonly, Stop not believing in Jesus and start believing in Jesus. But in the Bible, while repent often does mean to stop something and start something else, it does not necessarily follow that the thing stopped is something bad or something evil. In our Old Testament reading this morning from Jonah, there is some repenting going on. And you might assume that I'm talking about the Ninevites, the people of Nineveh who have heard God's judgment against them. But in fact, in the verses that we read, the only one who actually repents is God. Now, the Bible translators are 
understandably a little squeamish about saying God repented. And so in our translation, we heard God changed his mind. But in reality, repented is a more literal, more accurate translation. Now I suspect that when most Christians hear Jesus' words, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe in the good news, we assume that this is not really addressed to us. And after all, we believe in the good news. We're done. But that misses the fact that Jesus calls us to do more than believe. He calls us to follow Him. And every call invites us to something new, but this requires us to leave something behind. <coughs> Discovering something new, something better, something more meaningful, something more profound, means leaving something else. It's not saying that that other thing was something bad or evil, but moving to something new requires turning away from something old. You, you cannot enter into the joy of being an adult without leaving childhood behind. You cannot give yourself to another person in marriage without, as the old wedding vow used to say, forsaking all others. Ties to, to family, to old flames, have to recede for the new thing to bloom and grow. And it's something of a risk, a leap of faith that trusts that the new thing is worth leaving the old behind. Jesus says that the kingdom, the coming reign of God requires letting go of old ways. The, the kingdom is not like the societies and the governments that we humans devise. And Jesus says that if we are going to become a part of that new thing, it requires repenting. Turning away from the old in order to embrace God's wonderful newness. I read a story the other day about a a young teenage boy who was riding on the Miami, Florida city bus. This is back in the days prior to the civil rights movement. He and his brother would take the bus to their downtown church for children's choir practice. The return home coincided with the end of the work day and so the, the bus would fill up with domestic workers and day laborers who were returning home after a long, hard day of work. And this boy, William was his name, noticed that a great number of these workers had to make the entire trip standing up. This was back in the day when people of color were required to ride in the back of the bus. And there weren't many seats and the few seats there would fill up. And bothered by this, William felt a call to do something. He was a, a white boy, but he decided that he would go and sit in the back of the bus in one of those seats, and when all the seats would fill up, he would then wait, and when an African-American woman would get on, he would get up and give her his seat. Now, now I think that this is precisely the sort of repenting that Jesus calls all of us to do. The segregated bus system was not William's doing. He didn't have any power over that. In a very real sense, William could have simply sat in those seats in the front and been doing nothing wrong. But to move into God's newness required him to take a risk, a leap of faith, and move out of his comfort area into that newness of God. So he made one small step in moving the world a little closer to being like God's promised reign. Repenting, turning from the old and moving towards God's newness uh, must have come naturally to William. He not only did this, but he was later instrumental 
in his congregation merging with another downtown Miami congregation, forming a, an interracial congregation that became known for its ministry to the downtown homeless in Miami at the precise time that many of the other congregations were fleeing for the safety of the suburbs. But what about us? How is it that we are called to repent, to turn and move away from something and towards something, both as individuals and as a congregation? Where is it that we are called to move towards the newness of God? When Jesus calls those fishermen, we don't really learn anything about their past, about whether they loved or disliked fishing. For all we know, some of them, it was the, the only thing they had ever dreamed of doing. But that is not the issue in the story. It is all about Jesus calling them to something new. Follow me. And immediately, they left their necks and follow Him. If you ever sit down and read Mark's Gospel start to end, you will likely realize that one of His favorite words is immediate. In fact, He writes it so often that sometimes translators don't even bother to translate it. Immediate. But I've noticed over the years that almost nothing ever happens in a church immediately. We're... We church folks are, are cautious, careful sorts. We, we do things deliberately after a lot of consideration, a lot of debate. We don't like to be heard. We don't like to do things immediately. Now, there's certainly, certainly ways that, uh, many things for this to recommend. It's a, not a bad idea. Being cautious in this way prevents us from running off half-cocked from chasing after every new fad. But I also wonder if it sometimes doesn't make it very difficult for us to repent, to turn away from familiar habits and routines, and to move towards the newness of God, the reign of God that Jesus invites us to be a part of and to show to the world. I worry sometimes that if Jesus passed by and said, follow me, that I would respond, well, do you have some materials you could leave with me and perhaps a link to your website and I'll look it all over and maybe I'll get back to you. And Jesus would go on His way. The world is not what God longs for it to be. What, what God dreams that it will be. You and I are not what God longs for us to be and what God dreams that we will be. There is something better. Something much more wonderful in our future, in God's future. And Jesus calls us toward that future saying, follow me. And the meeting they left their nets, their past, their comfort zones, their tried and true, and followed Him. Thanks be to God.